Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Lincoln on this Sunday morning. My name is the Reverend Oscar Sinclair. We're joined in this video by members of the staff of the Unitarian Church of Lincoln. Our membership and admin coordinator, Kelly Ross, is hosting the call and coordinating the technology. Bob Hewson, Gene Helms, and Chelsea Krafka are here with readings, music, and support. And several of us are present in the chat room running beside this video on Sunday morning. We also have lay pastoral care folks on call this morning. And so if you need somebody to talk to, reach out and we will get you in contact with one of them. We continue to do this new way of being together. This is a time of anxiety in the world and in the church, but it is also a time of tremendous possibility. We're learning a lot fast about how to be a church together and apart. If you were at the town hall this Thursday, you heard some of that. I would encourage you to come to the town hall after this service to find out more about what, we're going, what we've been doing and to come to the congregational meeting that's going to happen two weeks from today. What stayed the same throughout all of this and what's guided our work through this time is the vision of this church, that the Unitarian Church of Lincoln aspires to be a loving community, uniting reason with spiritual exploration to transform ourselves and transform the world. It's a big vision, and we know that it begins with welcome. So whether this is your first time here or your 500th, if you have stumbled onto this YouTube video by accident, or if you're a longtime member trying to figure out how to log on, or a longtime member who has, after six weeks of doing this, figured it out, and this is part of your Sunday morning routine. If you came here hopeful or heartbroken, whatever your age, gender, skin, color, whomever you love, you're welcome with us. More than ever right now, it's important that we share this place. So our ask is simple. Do not keep this community a hidden gem. Invite people to come. We have this service on Sunday morning. We have our Zoom Vespers on Thursday night. We have interviews and daily updates on YouTube, offerings from the religious education program, music being produced, connection groups for members, talent shows, all of these things we are putting out. So join us and invite people in to be a part of what's going on in this church, in this community, in this moment. As we enter into worship this morning, take a moment to center yourself wherever you are. Find a comfortable place. Take a few deep breaths. And let us begin. Our chalice lighting words this morning are by the poet Khalil Gibran, who writes, your joy is your sorrow unmasked, and the self-same well from which your laughter rises was oft times filled with your tears, and how else can it be? The deeper that sorrow carves into your being, the more joy you can contain. Is not the cup that holds your wine the very cup that was burned in the potter's oven? And is not the lute that soothes your spirit the very wood that was hollowed by knives? When you are joyous, look deep into your heart, and you shall find it is only that which has given you sorrow that is giving you joy. And when you are sorrowful, look again in your heart, and you shall see that in truth you are weeping for that which has been your delight. Some of you say joy is greater than sorrow. And others say, no, sorrow is greater. But I say unto you, they are inseparable. Together they come. And when one sits alone with you at your board, remember that the other is asleep on your bed. Our opening hymn is number 1007. In the Teal Hymnal, there's a river flowing through my soul.
friends who die getting older, getting closer toward the end of life tests people's faith and they also, it also tests people's atheism. It sounds like your your atheism is staying strong. <laughs> is what? Staying strong. <laughs> yes. It, it, I'm not unhappy about becoming old. I'm not unhappy about what must be. It makes me cry only when I see my friends go before me and life gets is emptied. I don't believe in an afterlife, but I still fully... <laughs> expect to see my brother again and it's like a dream life I am reading a biography of Samuel Palmer which was written by a woman in England I can't remember her name and it's sort of how I feel now when he was just beginning to gain his strength as a creative man and beginning to see nature but he believed in God you see and he believed in heaven and he believed in hell Goodness gracious, that must have made life much easier. It's harder for us non-believers, but you know, there's something I'm finding out as I'm aging, that I am in love with the world. As I look right now, as we speak together out my window in my studio, and I see my trees, my beautiful, beautiful maples that are hundreds of years old, that they're, they're beautiful. And you see, I can see how beautiful they are. I can take time to see how beautiful they are. It is a blessing to get old. It is a blessing to find the time to do the things, to read the books, to listen to the music. You know, I, I don't think I'm rationalizing anything. I really don't, since this is all inevitable. And I have no control over it. I have nothing but praise now really for my life I, I, I'm not unhappy mm -hmm. I cry a lot because I miss people I cry a lot because they die and I can't stop them they leave me and I love them more but I have my young people here four of them who are studying and they look at me as somebody who knows everything of four kids Oh, God, there are so many beautiful things in the world which I will have to leave when I die, but I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready. Well, listen, You know, I yeah. have to tell you something. Go ahead. You are the only person I have ever dealt with in terms of being interviewed or talking to who brings this out in me. There is something very unique and special in you, which I so trust. When I heard that you were going to interview me, I thought you wanted to. I was really, really pleased. Well, I'm really glad we got the chance to speak, because when I heard you had a book coming out, I thought, what a good excuse <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> to call up Maurice Sendak and have a chat. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's what we always do, isn't it? Yeah, it's it is. It's what we've always done. It is. Thank God we're still around to do it. Yes. And uh, Almost certainly I'll go before you go, so I won't have to miss you. Oh, God, what a... S <laughs> and, and I don't know whether I'll do another book or not. I might. It doesn't matter. I'm a happy old man, but I will cry my way all the way to the grave. <laughs> well, I'm so glad you have a new book. I'm really glad we had a chance to talk. I am, too. And I wish you all good things. I wish you all good things. Live your life, live your life, live your life. still not sure about death as a worship topic right now even even in this moment as we're recording this worship service i'm i'm wondering if it's the right topic for the right day so i, I wrote the sermon title rest assured 
death and universalism back in June, thinking that it was a, a catchy title and it would be an interesting way to enter into our monthly theme of thresholds. Of course, I did not know then, and I have barely begun to understand now how the presence of mortality has changed our lives. This week, the official death toll from the COVID-19 pandemic surpassed the number of American service people who died during the Vietnam War. I went to seminary in Washington, DC. I have walked the length of the Vietnam Memorial more times than I can count. And every time I, I am struck by how many names, how many stories 50,000 is. When I think of other times of pandemic when death has become a character in the popular imagination or the, the topic of nursery rhymes. And other times that we've apparently decided as humanity not to remember. We just finished the 100th anniversary of the First World War. There were movies made. But until this pandemic hit, had any of us given a whole lot of thought to the 100th anniversary of the flu pandemic of 1918? So in this moment, in May of 2020, mortality is very present. Death is very present in the world, absolutely. And in another sense, we know as a church that it is always here, that life is a terminal condition. And finding meaning in that is the work of all of us regardless of theology. Churches are a big part of that. The church is a place where we can be honest about life. To be a human being is to know two things at the same time, that we are alive and that someday we will not be. To be honest about that. To place it on the table in front of us and look at it together. That is a bold thing that churches can do. As far as theology goes, death is the place where my agnosticism is most pronounced. I do not know what happens after death. I can say and do that those that have died live on in some way through the stories and impacts they had on the world. But I don't know what will happen to me, to my soul, to my sense of self when I die. Shakespeare called it the undiscovered country from whose born no traveler returns. So what we do know is that it is an end, maybe not the end, but an end. And it is because there is an end that life can be so beautiful. Maurice Sendak is right. More and more, I am in love with the world. And I will weep someday to leave it. But it is weeping at the beauty of each day. To be alive, to, to have this small moment in time that we share together is beautiful. I learned that from, from my grandfather who writes, and I have quoted it in sermons before, so far as we can tell, most of the universe is either empty or locally violent. Very little matter is sentient. Being alive together at the same time is rare, precious, and in some sense, holy. Holiness is present in each moment joy and sadness, sorrow and celebration. One of the hymns that, um, while it is in our hymnal, you will never actually hear me call in a worship service, is one titled, When Our Heart is in a Holy Place. It's one of the most beautiful melodies in our hymnal, but the theology is almost impossible for me. 
when our heart is in a holy place, because every moment, every place is holy. And so as this next song plays, We Are is the song. I'd ask that this morning you take a moment and go to the chat box running next to this. I think it's on this side. I haven't quite figured that out yet. And type in where you felt holiness in the last week. It might be a place of sorrow. It might be a place of joy. It might be, like for Maury Sendak, a little of both. And it might be the simplest of things, just sitting on a chair with a cat. Let us begin. Our next reading comes to us from May Sarton. Did someone say that there would be an end, an end, oh, an end to love and mourning? What has been once so interwoven cannot be unraveled, nor the gift ungiven. Now the dead move through all of us, still glowing, father and child, Lover and lover mated are wound and bound together and in flowing. What has been plated cannot be unplated. Only the strands grow richer with each loss. 
and memory makes kings and queens of us. Dark into light, light into darkness spin. When all the birds have flown to some real haven, we who find shelter in the warmth within listen and feel new cherished, new forgiven. As the lost human voices speak through us and blend our complex love, our mourning without end. There's a moment in most memorial services at the Unitarian Church of Lincoln when I ask those gathered together to look around the room. Each person here, I say, is here because their lives were touched by the person who is gone. We each have stories, I say. Each of our stories is different because we knew this person. And now all of our stories connect in some small way because we are together in this moment. Churches are holders of stories. In a very explicit way, they are the keepers of the big capital S stories, the myths that are at the heart of our cultural inheritance, stories of exodus, of lotus blossoms, of good news and golden plates of rabbits in the moon, the foundational myths of religion, and here I mean myths not in the sense of a literal fiction, but myths as stories that hold meaning beyond whether or not they are descriptions of historical events. Those stories get passed down from generation to generation, each interpreting them in a new way. But churches are also, and maybe more importantly, about the stories of people. We know now, maybe more than we have ever known before, that the church is not a building. The church is not a cathedral. The church is the gathered. All of the individuals that make up a community, each with their own lives, hopes, memories, that is the church. And so how we remember those stories and share our own becomes a central, vital task of the church as a whole. How we do that is a little bit different right now. <clears throat> I can't pause this service and ask you to look around the sanctuary at all of the people and all of the stories gathered together. But I can pause for a moment and ask you to hold in your mind someone from this church who you are not related to, whose story you hold. Let's take just a moment and do that. And now I'm going to ask you to trust that there is someone here remembering your story. And the thing about YouTube, the thing about this way of doing worship is, is this, that person might be in the call right now, or watching YouTube at the same moment you are across town from you. Or that person might be years in the future watching this video to remember what these months we're like, and despite all of those ways of being distant from each other, we are bound together in this. It might be the first person you met at the church or the last person you had coffee with. The point is this, we are interconnected. What has been plated can never be unplated. You are remembered. It's hard to find historical precedent for this moment, for a person and a profession that depends on 
finding historical continuity in story, it's, it's a professionally stressful moment. But I've been spending a lot of time with 1919. It's the closest we have to this moment in recorded history, I think. A year where it already felt like the world was on fire. And then a sudden pandemic changed the face of a generation. There was a tradition for about 30 years in Boston of writing liturgies for all souls once a year, poems of reflection and remembrance. The tradition started in 1918 and then carried through the end of the war, the flu, the depression, the second world war, and then only ended as a tradition, near as I can tell, in the relatively prosperous and future-oriented post-war years. There's a wisdom in that tradition. And so I'm going to close this morning with a reading from 1919. The, both the author and the poet that they quote are anonymous. All that I've been able to find out for sure is that it was written in Boston in 1919 in the aftermath of war and pandemic. I've edited it slightly to remove the gendered language of the time that it was written. In one who goes beyond for strength, the poet writes, there is a silence as deep and sure as the utter silence of a summer sky when the winds are quiet. And it is this silence we need. It is this silence we cleave to after the confusion of shallow tongues preaching the shallow doctrines of the hour. Everything else shall go to dust, everything in the shipwreck of eternal change. They only shall be safe who have ceased to make of their barbarous will the center of their life. But removing the lap of their imagination and gathering about them tender and apprehensive thoughts of their beloveds into the great silence of the moment. In such moments when our minds are free and ranging the universe without and within, our bodies are seen in public places. People speak to us and we reply, but we are not there. Who shall say where we are? Who then shall say where our dead are? Why are they not always about us? What if every day were All Souls Day when our dead return? What if we let their souls go laughing and singing in our own and ours in theirs eternally? It's from Beacon Press's Litany for All Souls, published in 1945. That particular one was written in 1919. Those who have gone before, are they not about us always? In the stories we tell and in the ripples they leave in our lives. And when we are gone, shall our souls not go laughing and singing through the years? And the connections and the loves we leave behind. I believe that they will. Amen and blessed be. As we recorded this service, I joked with Oscar that he might have warned me to make sure I bring, brought my Kleenex with me. Um, luckily, I'm wearing a long dress, but I wanted to say one thing quickly. I am very proud to serve this church at this strange and beautiful time. And I also agree that everything is holy now. A few announcements as we move to a close of our time together. The spring congregational meeting is coming up May 17th. That's a Sunday, it's at 11 o'clock. In preparation, you were sent virtual voting instructions last Thursday and the May Beacon newsletter was in the e-blast on Friday. So lastly, members, please plan on joining us for the second town hall, which is today, Sunday, May 3rd, after this service at 11 o'clock. Refer to the Saturday e-blast for the links to that Zoom meeting. Thank you. 
So our closing song this morning is not a hymn, but it is one of the pl- one of the pieces that we play often on Thursday night. It's a benediction by Sam Baker. He describes it as a song to make sure that everybody gets home. But it's also a meditation on mortality. It's played today by our own Michelle Dobswitz. This is Go in Peace. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of love, or the fire of commitment. These we carry with us until we are together again. Be at peace, beloveds, and amen.